When I was with my eighth wife, Sun Lao, her cousin was always hanging around. And one day in the middle of supper, she shows up with this brand new first generation Hyundai Tucson. And I ask her, what is this creature and why did you buy it? And her explanation was just pretty simple. It was cheap. Now, if you were to travel back in time 12, 13 years ago and would have told me all that Hyundai's been able to accomplish in this time frame, I wouldn't have believed you. And I think that's what the, the point of this is, is perspective. This Tucson is the evidence. This shows you just exactly how far they've come as a brand from then to now. They have a brand identity here. This mainstay grill, the LED headlight, and the whole design here of this just front end of the car. You can tell it's a Hyundai, especially if you start looking at the Sonata and the other high volume vehicles that they do. The designers of the Tucson have shown restraint here. While some of the luxury brands and their competition are trying to go with this ultra futuristic, modern looking, uh, CUV, SUV design where they use a lot of gimmicks, they've just kind of stuck to what's worked in their cars and just transformed it into this larger proportion without giving you a ton of wheel gap, without making it look like a hideous monster. This is a smooth looking, uh, modern but conservative design that I think most people will find attractive. One of the things that's really annoyed me about the Tucson is this rear hatch release. It's really slow. and. You know, most of the power lift gates are slower, but this one specifically also has given me the problem of not latching correctly. Even with nothing in here, it'll latch and kind of half latch and I get in the car and it'll beep at you and say it's not close. So you have to sit there, put it in park, hold the button, let it relatch. It just, I don't know if it's a problem with this, but this is one of those cars where I wish I could just take this off and have a manual lift gate. Now, if you're somebody looking for a crossover or a small SUV, you're gonna look at the Tucson, you're gonna open this hatch and you're gonna say, wow, this looks wide and tall. I can do everything I want. It even has this fancy, uh, pretty ruggedized cargo cover in here to hide your gear. The thing is, I've been in and out of a lot of cars lately, even compact cars, where I can fit all my gear in the trunk of these cars or hatches without folding down the seats. In the Tucson, I almost always have to take this beam off to get everything in here and fold down the seats. And that's super annoying. And something I've noticed about the crossover segment is this is a very misleading cargo space. What are we under? I forgot what it was already. The 2016 Hyundai Tucson. Oh yes, that's right, the Tucson. Uh, you want to know one good thing about this is this is not the all-wheel drive version this is front wheel drive only and it has it puts down the power really well like incredibly well oh, I should be going to the rear not the front well I mean it's a front-wheel drive platform I would rather have this than the all-wheel drive because you're getting less weight and it, it really is quick and it puts on the power totally fine I think for 90% of people if you're on the fence just some winter tires and you'd be good Scott what do we got <laughs> Some Kumho Kruggins premium uh, tires. Mrs. Kruggins worth? Yeah, 245, 45, 19. Now, there is something interesting about these tires, right? Is the replacement cost? Well, it depends what you go with. I looked anywhere from 130 to 360 per tire. But what are the Kruggins? I didn't get that far. I didn't really care. Oh, okay. Well, but tires, you know, surprisingly for a 19 inch tire, you know. I was can, cheaper than I thought. Yeah, so 135 a pop, not a big deal. Let's take a look at the back. We come to the back, Scott. And you found some aluminum. Yeah, you found some aluminum. Mm -hmm. I was about ready to say everything. I was thought scared. it was brushed to nickel finish. Oh, oh yeah. Well, that's the kind of hardware that you like to put in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. I could see you probably stealing this out of here, out of the toxin and just grinding it down for a new handle for your uh, dog treat drawer. There you go. <laughs> There is a lot of space back here. You, this is a compact multi-link rear suspension like most cars now, but it's like, that it looks like there's wasted space. And then, like you said, there's plenty of open room here for the all wheel drive model. So we got a 1.6 liter in here, turbo. Mm -hmm. And I've said this to you already, it looks like there's a ton of room in here. Ton. Too much. You. It seems as though Hyundai or Kia plan to use this chassis for a V6 that it doesn't have. 
But the good thing about that is, clearly, there is a ton of room to work on There's it. a ton of room to put a huge intercooler. That hood-mounted intercooler? Hell yeah. This 1.6 liter's been retuned. It has a lot more torque. Uh, and driving it, you can tell immediately that it's more than enough for this chassis, for the, the type of people that are going to be driving it. You have an easy-to-access air filter again. How do you feel about that? Look at that. Just look at it. Your in intercooler's there. Essentially, it's going to be the same picture that we saw with the Veloster Turbo, but a lot easier to access and get at everything. <laughs> For the most part. <laughs> I mean, you can actually see the turbo on this car back here, which you you know was buried in the firewall and the others. You going to do a blow-off valve? I would be the first thing I would do. How many decibels? As loud as you can get. I'm finally taking a ride in the Tux, and this is just, of course, I've said this, and it seems like most of these new modern cars, especially from Hyundai and Kia, are extremely well put together. This feels really solid. That's just the first impression you can get. It's quiet. Uh, it's controlled. The ride quality is pretty decent, especially for the price range. And there's about 7,500 miles on this car, and there's really not any creaks or rattles in here in terms of plastics or just things that stand out. Now, this is the 1.6 liter, and this is the motor that Hyundai has put tons of money in, over $50 million, and now it's trickling into other cars. So this 1.6 liter turbo now has the dual clutch transmission. Now this motor has been a little bit retuned and this dual clutch is now getting uh, repurposed in all the rest of their mainstream cars. So let's take a look and see how it does. Uh, we're gonna go in sport mode and we're gonna go in manual mode with the traction and stability control off here and just see how the, the chassis responds and how everything responds. It auto up shifts. Down shifts are pretty good, pretty direct. Uh, this feels extremely well controlled. Uh, I'd, I'd say for a vehicle of its size, yes, this is more car based, of course, but I don't have any issue, and I think most people are not going to have any issue with driving this car in an aggressive manner. Uh, it doesn't feel like an SUV. It doesn't feel like a, a, you know, a big vehicle. That's my point. It won't let you select second unless you're in about 3,000 RPMs. Uh, if you're above 3,000 RPMs in third or third gear, it's not going to let you downshift. Let's take a look at the acceleration. Auto upshift still. I have to say, uh, I think this 1.6 liter with the way they have it tuned here, uh, again, you're, this is more eco-tuned, right? It, it's giving you all that torque down low. It's giving you all the power down low. So your daily commute, your daily drive feels like you're driving a, a larger motor, like a V6. And it works so well. And I think for most people driving this, uh, you're going to be extremely happy with it. There's more power here than really what you need. Uh, so it's good, there is some overhead. You're never gonna feel like, oh my God, I'm not having enough power to pass or I'm not having enough power to get going. It feels really quick for the type of vehicle this is. Yeah, the trans just is not that responsive. Obviously, you're not gonna be driving this in manual mode. Now the thing is, I've spent a lot of time messing around with how this thing's programmed and I really haven't found any bugs. Now the only thing you'll notice is when you downshift, It brings up the revs and then that clutch slowly engages so there's never any harsh engagement. It won't just lock up and give you a quick shift. It does progressively grab like you were slipping the clutch on a manual transmission, which is gonna be good for most people that are daily driving this. I don't think they're gonna even know this is a dual clutch, but upshifts are pretty quick. They're not lightning fast, but it's always progressive. So let's start from a dead stop here and give it just a little bit of gas. 
and it won't let you, if you're on the brake, it won't let you rev up the motor at all. So you can't brake torque this thing. But as you, as you let off the brake, sometimes the dual clutch gets a little confused and it, it doesn't engage. Uh, so you have to kind of trick it, let it roll a little bit, and then it grabs right away. Turbo just spools up immediately. Let's downshift here and go through some turns. It really doesn't understeer all that much. It doesn't have a lot of torque steer either, which is really good. You know, it does have some body roll, of course, because this is a higher vehicle, but I think a lot of people are gonna be really impressed with the way this car drives. Uh, it's surprising for the size, and I know it's not a big car, but you would think that this thing would be more roly-poly, and it's not. Now we're gonna go into, you know, take this out of manual mode, uh, turn the traction stability back on, and put it in regular drive mode. And when you go into sport, uh, sport mode essentially synthetically increases the steering weight. Uh, also sport mode will allow the transmission to always keep a lower gear, and all that does is it keeps the turbo ready to go and the throttle response is more instantaneous. So if you're in sport, you'll notice the revs are higher. You tap that gas or you breathe on the throttle, this thing just picks up immediately. That doesn't have to downshift. And when you're in normal mode, the car will have to downshift to give you that throttle response you're looking for, and it take, there's some delay there. But in terms of fuel economy, you're going to save a lot of fuel driving in a normal or the eco mode and leaving it out of sport. Ride quality in here is pretty good. Uh, it's well dampened. You're going to get a good balance of a little bit of sport versus a little bit ride comfort. Uh, it's not a totally isolated driving experience. This does not have that luxury car feel. Uh, but it feels like it's driving like a mid-sized sedan. When you get in the higher speed or on concrete surface like this, there is a lot more road noise coming from it. Of course, you have bigger wheel and tire combo here. Uh, but overall, it's not the quietest car, but it's, it's totally acceptable for this price range. I think most people are going to really in, enjoy how well this car is put together overall. It's a good time to talk about the safety systems. This car has forward crash mitigation which means you know, it will bring you to a complete stop under a certain speed. It has blind spot monitoring, which is pretty good. It's not overly aggressive. Uh, you know, Some cars, it's constantly alerting you that there's cars around you, even when they're pretty far back. This has a good programming. Uh, in terms of lane departure warning, uh, it alerts you, but it doesn't correct you. And I actually, I just leave it off. And one of my biggest complaints here is this blind spot monitoring LED that's on the left here to let you know that it's on. It is so bright, especially at night, even with this dim down, that blue light is like searing. And actually I turned off the, I turn off the blind spot monitoring because I can't stand how bright that light is. I feel like I'm starting to sound like a broken record, specifically with the last couple Hyundais and Kias I've been in. They've gotten to a point where they really understand the human to machine connection here. Uh, the driver ergonomics are very, very good. The HVAC controls, for example, it's right within, you know, essentially six inches from your hands. You have physical knobs. The controls and buttons are very well laid out, easy to read. The fonts are very good in the Hyundai in terms of readability. Your volume controls the same way, physical knobs, physical buttons. Everything you need to do is right here without really having to take your eyes off the road much to do anything. Let's talk about the pros and cons of the comfort. For the first time in a Hyundai car, and I bitched about this incessantly, they have finally padded this center stack area where your right knee rests. You're no longer on hard plastic, thank God. But they've kind of screwed it up because the door armrest area where you're resting your left elbow is just really cheap. And this center armrest uh, feels like it has no padding on it. But the good thing is it's in a really good position. So whether you're tall or short, if you're forward or back, you still have a good area on the armrest to, to, to be on. The seat comfort, well, my only complaint here is the bottom cushion feels really flat. I got a sore ass within an hour of driving this car, and I don't know if it's just because the seats aren't all that broken in or if I'm just too bony for the structure and design of this seat.
I just got out of the Kia Optima, the SX model, and I thought that was one of the better mainstream steering wheels I'd ever been in. And then I get into this car, and it's not that the shape is bad, you have glove leather wrapped all the way around, you don't have any perforation. It's not that it's not simply laid out, but the big mistake that they've made here is this call accept and call hang up button is protruded so far out on the steering wheel that when you turn the steering wheel or you change hand direction, you are constantly bumping these. And why that's a problem is I often turn the screen off at night. It's just too bright for me. I'm always hitting it, turning on the screen, or I'm accidentally dialing somebody. The other thing that's really starting to bother me about, not so much about Hyundai, it's more of a discussion about Hyundai and Kia. I've gotten into a lot of their cars lately and there's not a whole lot to differentiate them in terms of interior space. Specifically when you start talking about the overall layout and design, they almost share the same gauge clusters. They share the same infotainment now. A lot of the button layout, well, I mean the font's different, but the button layout's almost identical. If you covered up the Hyundai badge, I would almost think it's a Kia, and I think that's starting to become more of a problem. The only area that I've seen here that they're doing something a little bit different and better is this dash texture on the top. They finally have this like leather surface instead of this hard industrialized plastic with this stitching that actually looks like real stitching. So that's a, that's a good thing here, but for the most part, uh, these cars just share too much at this point. Speaking of infotainment, now if you've been in a, a modern Kia or Hyundai, you'll realize the software is identical, and that's because their technical center in Michigan does a lot of their HCI design, so they're kind of sharing that. Now the difference here is kind of just some of the fonts, but other than that, it's identical. Getting around here is all touchscreen based, and then you have physical buttons down here. You don't have a central control, which makes it a little cumbersome to get around especially when you hit the menu screen, because your touch scrolling here is just kind of slow to respond. It's not designed for multi-touch, and this head unit does not have the Apple Google software update, which I actually kind of miss after being in the Kia, but obviously there's going to be an update for that, so that's it's kind of a moot point. Overall, the usability is pretty good. The sound quality in here is pretty average. I, I would say that most people aren't going to notice that. The EQ settings are, are okay, but for the most part, this functions. It pairs up with your phone quick. The backup camera is pretty good. Most people are not going to be offended by this software, but I would say overall my impression is it's just average. Mm -hmm.